Hi everyone. So a while back, Inspiring Philosophy, a Christian apologist who's managed to become kind of notorious on YouTube actually, made a video saying that skeptics, by which I assume he means atheists, are rejecting logic or that they are at least saying that logic is not reliable. Can we trust the laws of logic? Is logic safe from criticism? Or is it just another man-made construct built on sand? Interestingly, Christians, unlike skeptics, have a history of explicitly rejecting logic, at least when it becomes inconvenient. For example, Martin Luther said that reason is a whore, and in more recent years, Kirk Cameron was pleading with us to abandon intellect and reason, for only then will we be stupid enough to take his bullshit seriously, or something like that. When you learn how to speak to a person's conscience and circumnavigate the intellect, the subject of evolution, seems to disappear. They're both absolutely correct. Reason, which is what logic is all about, is the enemy of faith. When apologists say that logic proves that God exists, they're misusing the term. They either don't know what it means, or they are relying on the fact that other people generally don't. So, what is logic? Logic simply is a description of everything that is, and everything that is possible. Nope. Sorry, IP. That's not how the word is used in philosophy, or mathematics, or even in colloquial English. Now, before I set you straight, I always want to assume that an apologist is being dishonest. I mean, apologetics is the defense of a faith, the defense of a position that by definition cannot be defended. It cannot be done honestly, so I assume that all apologists know that they are full of shit. They are either atheists running a scam, or they are theists who are knowingly presenting bad arguments, trying to fool others into becoming or remaining theists. But since I can't prove that you, IP, are being dishonest, intellectual honesty, which I'm sure is something you're unfamiliar with, forces me to apply a little rule called Hanlon's razor. Never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. Might I suggest that the first thing you should do before talking about logic is to at least Google the word? I can't find your definition of logic anywhere online a person would go to learn about it, and I assume I don't even have to mention academic or even high school textbooks. I check websites that try to introduce laymen to philosophy, online encyclopedias, even ordinary dictionaries, and from what I can find, there is a complete consensus on this matter. Logic is the study of valid inference, that is, how to reason, how to draw valid conclusions from given premises using rules of deduction, exactly what every textbook I've ever read says, whether at the high school or university level. I like to put it this way, logic is the study that tries to make sense of when something makes sense. That is, why some arguments make you go, damn, that's right, I can't argue with that, and others don't. It's not about the rules of reality or something like that. It's about the rules of how we think and how we use language to construct arguments consistent with how we think. Logic has nothing to do with the reality being described by an argument. It's all about the form of the argument, the structure, which structures are valid. That is, how do I express myself in such a way that my language properly reflects the reasoning that allows me to infer the truth value of a linguistic proposition from those of other linguistic propositions? Now, IP says that skeptics attack the laws of logic using the liar paradox. Here's the argument. Premise 1. Assume that the laws of logic are true. Premise 2. All propositions are either true or false. Premise 3. The proposition, this proposition is false, is neither true nor false. Therefore, the laws of logic are not true. Honestly, I've never come across this argument from a skeptic. I suspect IP hasn't either, but is simply projecting his own inability to understand logic onto those who do, at least better than he does. First, the argument breaks down in premise two. Not all propositions are true or false. 
Okay, just one small problem. If I accept literally all laws of logic, then I also accept the principle of bivalence, which makes premise two true by definition. The principle of bivalence defines the set of possible truth values. It's the rule that says that every proposition is true or false. IP, you just failed to defend the laws of logic against a straw man attack that you yourself set up. That is some pretty impressive stupid right there. Of course, we can construct logics with three or more truth values, but not if we accept the principle of bivalence. We'd end up with a system that's internally inconsistent. But this shows exactly what IP's problem is. He doesn't know what the laws of logic are. He seems to think that they are laws that exist as entities in their own right. Things that we discover. The rules that literally govern reality or even all possible realities. You can't simply escape logic or step outside of it like a set of boundaries. He doesn't understand that laws like the principle of bivalence exist because when we make a simple straightforward proposition like Socrates is in Greece, then either he is or he isn't. The statement is either true or false. That's the type of linguistic propositions that classical logic deals with. If you want to deal with another kind of proposition, you have to use a different logic. Fuzzy logic, for example, and yes, that's what it's called, deals with propositions like this water is dirty. It's not appropriate to simply say that this is true or false. To handle the fact that water can be more or less dirty, fuzzy logic uses degrees of truth. We define what constitutes definitely clean, zero, and what constitutes definitely dirty, one. And if the actual state of the water is somewhere in between, then the truth value is a number somewhere between zero and one. So in premise one, what laws of logic do we accept? What laws of logic are you talking about? Are we talking about fuzzy logic, classical logic, three-valued logic, modal logic? The stupid kind of logic that allows a monotheistic religion to have three gods, one of which is entirely human. A proposition can be defined as a statement or assertion that expresses a judgment or opinion. So here IP is using a dictionary definition, ignoring that the same dictionary shows how the term is used in logic. And it does so poorly because it doesn't explain that the rules for propositions are different in different systems of logic. And we shouldn't expect it to. It's a dictionary, not a logic textbook. In classical logic, a proposition not only can be true or false, and by the principle of bivalence, it is true or false. That's why in classical logic, the definition of a proposition is a declarative sentence that is either true or false. A more general definition of what a proposition is in logic, classical or otherwise, would be an object that has a truth value. Consider the statement, Easter is the best holiday. This cannot be proven true or false, it is just an expression of opinion. So, the problem isn't that it's an opinion, the problem is that it's ambiguous. Best in what way? If you tell me that, and tell me what metric you're using to determine how good a holiday is, then maybe it is objectively the best holiday according to that standard. As it stands, however, this is not a proposition which is neither true nor false. It's not a proposition. I can't assign a truth value to it because I don't know how to do that. So it fails to qualify as a proposition. Carloman was murdered by his brother Charlemagne, so he could have the throne for himself. This statement is either true or false. However, we cannot be sure if it is true due to lack of information. Logic doesn't deal with how we know that a statement about external reality is true or false. That's epistemology, not logic. Logic doesn't deal with the content of an argument, it only deals with the form of the argument. Is the argument internally consistent? Is it valid? This argument itself is based on Gödel's theorems, which many think shows logic doesn't work. Many? Such as? Are any of these people whose opinions about this should be valued? Or are they just the kind of idiots that rake comfort interviews in the streets? But in a nutshell, they actually only show that no consistent system of axioms whose theorems can be listed by an effective procedure is capable of proving all truth. 
In other words, Gödel's theorems show we cannot fully prove something is true just because it seems like it is or is consistent. Then you have no idea what Gödel was talking about despite stating it yourself. I'm starting to think that applying Hanlon's razor was the correct move. And um, there's no R in Gödel. Gödel? Seriously? You seriously misunderstand Gödel's theorems if you think that they have anything to do with proving that there are propositions which are neither true nor false within systems that only allow those truth values. What Gödel showed was that not all statements can be proven true within a given system based on axioms. This doesn't mean that no true statement can be proven true or that unprovable statements are neither true nor false. It means exactly what it says. Some statements are true, but cannot be proven true within a given system. An example is, the truth of this sentence is unprovable. We have two possibilities. Either it is true or it isn't. If it is true, I will never be able to prove it, because the act of proving it would falsify it. If it isn't true, either because it has some other truth value than true, or because it doesn't have a truth value, then it is indeed correct that I can't prove it true. Either way, we should be convinced that the sentence is indeed true. The truth of the sentence is unprovable. It is true, we just can't formally prove it. We have to step outside the system and use sort of a common sense approach. That is, we can't prove it within whatever system we are using when we say it. So because of that, we can also deny premise 3 and say it is a false dichotomy. How the hell can you call it a false dichotomy to say that something isn't A or B? A false dichotomy is when you say that something is necessarily either A or B, when there is in fact a third option C. I can explain how and why if we reduce the problem to mathematics. The proposition can be represented as x equals negative 1 over x. Now like the statement in our argument, if you try to solve with x equals 1, the equation will yield negative 1. If you try x equals negative 1, then positive 1 comes back. The solution oscillates between 1 and negative 1, like true or false, 1 being true and negative 1 being false. So how do we escape this vicious cycle? The solution is to use i. So 1 is analogous to true and minus 1 to false, okay, what about i? All this would mean is that premise 2 is false because there are three possible truth values, true, false and whatever i is supposed to represent. If there are three truth values, how does this show what's wrong with premise 3? Okay, it's time to have a closer look at the liar paradox. IP's solution is, to no one's surprise I'm sure, the most naive one, to introduce a third truth value, neither. Chuck out the principle of bivalence and abandon classical logic. That works, but the underlying problem remains. What happens to the statement, this sentence is not true or neither? The problem has just been moved back and we can keep doing this over and over. So how many truth values do you want? By the reasoning I suspect IP used, I just proved that there is an infinite number of truth values. True, false, neither, none of the above, nope, nah, uh try again, bitch, please, and so on. There are, however, philosophers who have devoted a lot of time to finding a solution to the liar paradox within the framework of classical logic. Several solutions have been proposed, but there's no single magic bullet type solution that makes the problem go away without potentially introducing new ones. I won't go into any of the possible solutions here, but it's clear that this is no simple matter and that leads me to the last option. Screw you guys, I'm going home. To simply acknowledge that the liar sentence, this sentence is false, fails to qualify as a proposition and leave it at that. There's nothing wrong with that. This isn't an attack on logic, but an acknowledgement of the fact that just because it can be expressed in a language, it doesn't have to qualify as a proposition in that language. Remember that a proposition is an object that has a truth value. Not everything that can be expressed in a language needs to have a truth value. I suspect IP would try to argue that only his solution is acceptable. It's the correct one. He has discovered a truth about logic. 
true doesn't work, false doesn't work, so there must be a third truth value because of course there has to be one. It's pure deduction, but this isn't the case. The only conclusion that can be drawn is that unless there exists a solution, whatever that might be, the sentence simply cannot be assigned a truth value. There's no way to prove which of the conceivable solutions, if any, is the truly correct one, and that's because there's no correct system of logic. There are only systems that are more or less useful under a given set of circumstances. Again, the real problem with the argument IP is addressing isn't the second or third premise, but the first. What laws of logic do we accept? Which logic? Thus, mathematically, the problem can be solved, because I transcends the paradox. The only problem is we cannot epistemically understand the mathematical usage of I. We can. I can't say I'm surprised that you can't, but we certainly can. I is a number, the square of which is minus one. That's literally all there is to it. That's all there is to understand about it. It works like any other number, for example, just as x plus x equals 2x, i plus i equals 2i. It just so happens that when you square it, you get minus one. And yes, IP, I know that's all there is to it, because as even a high school level textbook will tell you, that is the definition of i. This isn't something we discovered and figured out how to use without properly understanding it. Like every other mathematical concept, the imaginary unit i is something we have defined. IP, this is high school level math. If you don't understand it, either shut up about it or go back to high school and take those optional courses in mathematics that the nerds took. Instead of saying that we don't understand it simply because you don't understand it. Thus Gödel is proven right, and not the absolute skeptic who doubts logic is true. Three things. One, no it doesn't prove Gödel was right. He was right, but this has nothing to do with his work. Two, logic is not a proposition. It's not true or false. It's a field of study. To say that logic is true makes no more sense than to say that geography is true. Three, we can have confidence in systems like math and logic, which actually is a branch of mathematics, precisely because of our doubt. Without skepticism, these systems wouldn't work because tons of false claims would be accepted as true. When applied in practice, this could have serious consequences. I wouldn't want to be a passenger on an airplane built by engineers who don't care whether their calculations are correct or not, but simply accept whatever results they get because duh, doubt is bad. The other thing to remember is you just can't deny the laws of logic. Sure you can. You reject the principle of bivalence when you introduce a third truth value. And when you limit yourself to three, you're rejecting all systems of logic that use more than three truth values. Again, you have no idea what you're talking about. To attack the laws of logic, you have to assume your attack on logic is logically formulated. If you actually didn't think the laws of logic were true, you would not be relying on logical reasoning to show the laws of logic are not true. If a system of logic is internally inconsistent, then I can use the system to demonstrate that. Or are you suggesting that its inconsistency would falsify the proof of its inconsistency? Because if so, who's denying logic here? If you're dealing with an epistemic skeptic, a good position to remember is particularism. Particularism is a formal response to a skeptic who doubts logic and knowledge. It states that we do not doubt or are skeptical of something unless we are given good reason to think so. So you accept everything you hear and every idea that pops up into your head as true until you have a reason to doubt it. Okay, I can't really argue with that, but I can provide you a reason to doubt something if you give a shit about whether it's true or not. The skeptic, of course, disagrees and thinks we need to prove knowledge claims are 100% true or else we should doubt them. Well, yes, if you're not 100% certain and that degree of certainty is justified, then there is some chance, however small, that you're wrong. If you don't doubt, you'll never know. If you don't doubt that 2 plus 2 equals 5 when someone says so, you'll believe it. 
If you don't doubt the Bible, you'll be a geocentrist, a creationist, and a flat earther. If you don't doubt that I am God, then if I were to tell you that I am, you'd believe me. Why not also doubt the dogma you've swallowed? If it's true, it should hold up. And, absurd as it may sound, the more you doubt, the more convinced you'll be. But, to hell with Hanlon's razor, as an apologist, I'm pretty sure you know why religions discourage doubt. See ya.